refused, re-emerged from the ladies' toilet and again smiled at me. I half smiled back, and then the next thing I knew was that I was being kissed. And the accused said, why don't you come back to my place, we can have a lot of fun. In today's trial of the Queen against Lola Martin, the jury has been selected from members of the public, whose names appeared on the electoral register and who are eligible for jury service. And what happened then, Sergeant Lent? Well, I said to him, what's your name? And he said, Lola. Lola Martin. I produced my police identification and advised him that I was arresting him for soliciting. I took hold of his arm, and then, to my astonishment, he hit me, whacked me right in the chin. Just one moment, Sergeant. Was there any particular reason for your astonishment? Yes, ma'am. Up until that second, I'd thought that I was arresting a woman. But uh, no woman could punch like that. Well, apart from the fact that Martin had just emerged from the ladies' toilet, what caused you to think you were arresting a woman? His clothes, wig, everything. He was dressed as a woman. You were telling my lord and the jury about when the accused hit you. What happened after that? Well, I grabbed him again and we struggled out into the main bar of the club. Detective Sergeant Wilson came to my aid and we hustled Martin outside and into a police car. And he was taken immediately to Fulchester Central Police Station and a short while later charged with persistently importuning for an immoral purpose. I also charged him with assaulting a police officer in the execution of his duty. The two charges that bring us here today. Did the accused say anything when he was charged? Yes, he did. Uh, may I consult my notebook, my lord? Were those notes made at the time he was charged? Yes, my lord. You may refer to them then. Thank you, my lord. After I had charged him with importuning, he said, girls will be boys and boys will be girls. It's a mixed up muddled up, shook up world, except for Lola. Sergeant Lent, this club where you were arrested, the accused, Verities, I believe it's called. Yes, my lord. Would I be right in assuming it is, amongst other things, a drinking club? Yes, it is. And had the accused been drinking? No, my lord, I gather he does not drink alcohol. I see. Would you repeat the remarks he made after he'd been charged with importuning? Girls will be boys. Boys. Boys will be girls. Girls. It's a mixed up, muddled up, shook up world. Shook up world. Except for Lola. Except for Lola. My lord. Uh, I cannot find the medical report on him. If I might offer some assistance, my lord. I'd be grateful for assistance from any quarter, Mr. Lee. Well, the words quoted by the detective sergeant, which we accept as having been uttered, although they do not form part of any official statement by my client. These words form part of a popular song of a few years ago. The song is entitled Lola. More particularly, my client has been known by the name of Lola Martin for nearly 10 years. If my learned friend has no objection, I will not wait until I examine this witness before offering as an exhibit copies of the sheet music of this song. Uh, Mrs. Forrest. I have no objection. No, that. this will become exhibit number seven. Would you give the witness a copy, please? No. I think my learned friend will find what she's looking for on page seven, my lord. I'm obliged, Mr. Lee. The song is called Lola by the Kinks. Ah, oh, yes, here we are. Those are the words on page seven that the accused uttered, Sergeant. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. Lee. Yes, ma'am. The sex of your client is male, is it not? Yes, male, my lord. And uh, who or what are the Kinks? The group, my lord, who originally recorded Lola, the words and music were written by a member of the group. Yes, I see. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Continue, Mrs. Morris. Did the accused say anything else after he had been charged with the first offence? No, but he kept blowing me kisses. He did what? He kept blowing me kisses, my lord. How exactly did he do that? <sighs> like that, my lord. Thank you, Sergeant. Did he make any written statement? No, he didn't. And was he a short while later charged with the second offence, that of assaulting you? Yes, he was. He made no comment and declined to make any written statement. Thank you very much, Sergeant. Uh, you were not, of course, in uniform at the time of the alleged offences, were you, Sergeant? No, sir. I was in plain clothes. On duty? Yes. Prior to the commencement of this trial, I requested that you attend with the clothes that you were wearing that evening. Do you have them with you? Yes. Here they are. I assume that you wish to examine them. 
You assume incorrectly, Sergeant. I want you to go and put them on. Uh, Milad. Yes, just a moment, Mrs. Forrest. Mr. Lee, why do you wish to see the Sergeant in those clothes? I, I want the jury to see him in those clothes, my Lord. They form a crucial part of the defence. I want the jury to see exactly what confronted my client when he stepped out of the toilet and made his way back to the bar. I would also request that the witness be asked to rearrange his hair so that it conforms with his appearance on the night of the alleged offences. Do you have any objections, Mrs. Forrest? Uh, yes, my Lord, I most certainly do. But... On consideration, my lad, I withdraw my objections. Well, that overcomes that hurdle. Uh, Sergeant, if you would be so kind to retire and put on those clothes... And adjust the hair, my lord. You're being a little previous, Mr. Lee. I was coming to that. And adjust your hair. I will take a short adjournment. Would you mind explaining to my lord and the jury exactly why you were dressed in that manner on the night of the alleged offences? At that time, I was on secondment to the CID Division of Fulchester. On the night in question, I was keeping surveillance with Detective Sergeant Wilson of the CID on the Verity Club. Was well, Detective Sergeant Wilson similarly attired? Yes, he was. Sergeant, exactly why were you and your colleague in that club on that particular night? Uh, Millard, the reason that the two officers were in that particular club on that particular night has nothing to do with the case. I can assure the court it had nothing to do with the accused. They were involved in investigations into quite another matter. If details of those investigations are made public at this time, it might seriously jeopardise those investigations. You hear me on this, my lord? Certainly, Mr. Lee. I submit that the jury should hear why these two policemen were in that club. I further submit that, as far as my client is concerned, these two policemen, particularly this witness here, were acting as agents provocateurs and that their aim was to entrap homosexuals. I think we should continue this discussion without the jury being present. I feel that several points of law are looming over the horizon. Are you agreeable to that course of action? Yes. Yes, my lord. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, there are several points of law that I wish to discuss with counsel. That will give you slightly longer for lunch. We shall be sitting again at two o'clock, but I must ask you not to re-enter the court until you're summoned by the usher. The court will rise. Now, Mrs. Forrest, why shouldn't the witness tell the court exactly what he was doing in this club on that particular night? Millard, he was at the time in question working with the drug squad. Information had been received that a large consignment of cannabis was going to change hands that night in the club. Because of the furore that accompanied Martin's arrest, the drug surveillance was called off. I understand the drug squad believed the exchange may still take place. If details of the squad's activities are made public at this time, they may well lose the opportunity of apprehending a drug ring. I note that you've already asked for and been granted three adjournments of this trial. Were those adjournments asked for because of the drug squad's activity? Yes, my lad. And despite those lengthy adjournments, no drug peddlers have been apprehended in this Verity's club. That is correct, my lad. In that case, I feel the witness should advise the jury why he was in that club. It's been said many times before, but it cannot be said too frequently. Justice must not only be done, it must be seen to be done. We don't want any hole and corner aspects. Now then, Mr. Lee, what's this about agent provocateur? My lord, I know nothing of drug peddlers operating at Verity's club, but one of the keystones to my defence is that these two police officers went to the club with the express purpose of entrapping homosexuals. I submit that this is why they were dressed in that manner. I further submit that Detective Sergeant Lent deliberately provoked my client into breaking the law. My lad... The defence of entrapment does not pertain in this country. And further, the Court of Appeal clearly considered in the Queen against Mealy and Sheridan that if a crime was brought about by someone who could be described as an agent provocateur, it might affect sentence. But it did not affect the question of guilty or not guilty. There have been rulings since 1974 that drastically affect that ruling, my lord. The Queen versus Amir and Lucas, July 1976, is the most recent, and there are a number of others that I can cite. Thank you, Mr. Lee. I came prepared. I am aware of the modifications of the Court of Appeals ruling. It seems to me, Mrs. Forrest, that with regard to the role of alleged agent provocateur, each case should be judged on its own particular merits. That is precisely what I intend to do in this case. I will adjourn for lunch now. Before the jury were sent out, Sergeant, you testified how you and Detective Sergeant Wilson were in 
Veritas Club on the night of September the 14th. Now, my Lord has ruled that you should answer the question my learned friend objected to. Exactly why were you there on that particular night? Acting on information received, we had been advised that a large consignment of drugs would be changing hands in the club on that particular evening. What kind of drugs, Sergeant? Cannabis. Was my client suspected of being involved in this drug ring? As far as we were concerned, all the customers in the club were suspect. Commendable. Let me put it another way. Have you since that night obtained a single shred of evidence that links Lola Martin with illicit drugs? No, sir. No. I'd like to ask you about your appearance, your attire. Is it normal to wear such clothes when engaged in undercover operations? Of course it is. The clothes vary depending on the nature of the work. We'd hardly expect to make any arrests dressed in uniform. The Club Verities is a drinking club, I believe. Yes, it is. You would agree with me that the bulk of the clientele are homosexuals, that it is well known in Fulchester as a gay club? Yes. They're not all gay, but most of them are. And gay being a euphemism for homosexual. Yes, my lord. I note from Exhibit 3, which is a register of club members, that both you and Detective Sergeant Wilson are members there. Are you a homosexual, Sergeant? The club is for members only. We could hardly sit there drinking if we were not members. I know that you've been a member for nearly a year. When were Fulchester Police first advised that the club might be a likely scene for illicit drug operations? August of this year. Yes. You'd been a member for some six months prior to that date. Why, Sergeant? Millard, I must object to the innuendo of these questions. Again and again in the courts of this country, when a police officer is called to give evidence, one is left with the impression that they themselves are on trial. My lord, I tell you frankly, my lord, my client does not believe this story of illicit drugs. He firmly believes that the reason this officer and his colleague were in that club was to catch homosexuals, or to use their jargon, roll over a few queers. I'm not putting this witness on trial. I'm merely trying to get at the truth. Mm, yes, I accept that. But I must agree with Mrs. Forrest that there, there is a, a certain unfortunate innuendo in your questions. Do you intend to produce evidence that this police officer is a homosexual? Yes, my lord, indeed I do. Firstly, I'd like to clear up this story about a drug ring operating at the club. Would I be right in assuming that neither on that night or any time since have any drugs been found, seized, or located on the club premises? Yes, you, you would be right, but there, but there could be a very good reason Yes, for that. you've Just... answered the question, Sergeant. Thank you. Millard, I feel the witness was about to qualify his answer. Might he be allowed to do so? Yeah, of course, Mrs. Forrest. Mr. Lee, you're defending your client with your customary zeal, but I must ask you not to harass the witness. I would apologize, my lord, having some considerable experience of cases like this one. I'm fully aware of how unpleasant harassment can be. I have no wish to subject the sergeant to such an ordeal. You never lose an opportunity, do you, Mr. Lee? One tries not to, my lord. Sergeant, you were telling the jury that there might be a very good reason why no drugs have been found in Verity's club since the night you arrested the accused. Now, would you please finish your answer? Well, my lord, it's precisely because he was arrested on that night. He kicked up such a fuss that any drug pushers would have been frightened off and slipped away. An unfortunate byproduct of the arrest, as it were. Exactly, my lord. Continue, Mr. Lee. Well, let us leave the question of drugs, then. Clearly, whether they existed or not, my client had no connection with them. Millard, could my learned friend be asked to refrain from making speeches to the jury? Yes, I think the witness has covered that aspect, Mr. Lee. The answer was that your client has no connection with any illicit drugs. I'm obliged, my lord. Prior to the moment when you arrested Martin in the club, how long had you been there, Sergeant? Nearly two hours. Did you observe Martin during that time? Yes, I did. Most of the time he was talking to two people at a table, but from time to time he came to the bar to buy drinks for them. And on one occasion he put his arm around a man and said, Hello, darling, what are you doing tonight? Did you hear my client referred to by name during that time? Yes, I did. Apart from chatting to the owner of the club, other people <coughs> called out greetings to him. They referred to him by the name of Lola. Just Lola? Yes. You stated earlier that you were standing in the corridor outside the toilets when the accused emerged from the ladies. Why were you standing there? I was keeping observation. Toilets are hmm. a well-known area for drug passing. 
prior to that, during the previous two hours, had you exchanged any words with the accused? Yes, I may have said hello on one occasion. And when you said hello, you exchanged a smile. I may have done. Now, you've testified that you've been a member of this club for nearly a year, is that right? Yes, dear. You've also testified that until the moment he hit you, you believed the accused was a woman. That's right. Oh, come now, Sergeant. You've been a member of that club for nearly a year, albeit for the purpose of infiltration. Surely you must have known that Lola Martin was a man. No, I didn't. You hadn't seen him before that night? Yes, on a number of occasions. You knew him well enough to smile at him and say hello, and yet you ask us to believe you thought the accused was a woman. He was dressed as a woman. He moved like a woman. He sounded like a woman. The club was very dimly lit, and women do use it, you know. Is homosexuals? Oh, well, yes, I've already said that. Look, it didn't matter to me whether Lola Martin was a man or a woman. We were in the club looking for drug pushers, not gays. You stated at the beginning of your evidence that when Lola Martin emerged from the ladies, he smiled at you, and you half smiled back. Yes, that's right. Why did you return his smile? Look, when you're doing work of this kind, the object of the exercise is to remain as inconspicuous as possible. Now, I'm not likely to catch any drug pussies if I go around in uniform whistling the theme from Zegkar. Did your dedication to duty have to go so far as to responding to him when he kissed you by kissing him back? Don't be bloody silly. He kissed me and then asked me to go back to his place. Where did he kiss you? On the lips. And I put it to you that your response was that of a homosexual. You returned, as it were, that kiss. My initial response was surprise. Then, after he had propositioned me and I'd shown him my identification and advised him that, I, that he was being arrested, he hit me. And my response then was amazement. Yes, I'm sure it was, Sergeant. No further questions. Sergeant, uh, during the period that you were seconded to the drug squad, apart from the undercover work you were involved in in Verity's Club, did you do other work of a similar nature? Yes, ma'am. Uh, nightclubs, gambling casinos, pop concerts. And presumably, as all of this work was basically infiltration and surveillance, you would have worn the appropriate clothes. Yes. Uh, for example, at a pop concert, would be T-shirt, jeans, beads, that sort of thing. Uh, did any of that undercover work result in successful prosecutions? Yes, ma'am. Quite a number. Uh, presumably, nobody saw fit to accuse you of being a hippie, a drug addict, or a gangster. Really, my lord? I would lord. draw the question, my lord. If my learned friend is so concerned with legal niceties, might she be asked to practice what she preaches and refrain from making speeches to the jury? Clearly, she's here to obtain a I conviction. I am here to obtain a hearing of this case. That will suffice from both of you. We are all here to obtain justice for the accused. Displays of acrimony are not calculated to achieve that aim. Now, Sergeant, the suggestion has been made that on the night in question, you were functioning as an agent provocateur. That while being employed to detect suspected offenders, you were also engaged in tempting, specifically the accused, to commit crime, that of soliciting. Now, leaving aside the merits and demerits of that particular argument, have you, on any previous occasion, been officially involved in that role? Yes, my lord. Two years ago, I infiltrated a group of political extremists by posing as someone who was sympathetic to their cause. And what about your earlier work with the drug squad that Mrs. Forrest was just asking you about? Well, I, I don't know if that comes under the heading of agent provocateur, but well, one poses as someone wishing to buy drugs, as someone who is into the drug scene. And are you familiar with the guidelines laid down by the Home Office with regard to police working in this area? Yes, my lord, I Would am. you consider that in this case you overstepped those guidelines? No, my lord. I most certainly did not. I was not in the club to entrap homosexuals. Thank you, my lad. I have no further questions. I call Edward Linger. I've been a journalist for over 20 years, and at the moment I'm working freelance. Were you on the night of September the 14th in a Fulchester club known as Verity's? Yes, I was. I was there with Lola Martin and a Dr. Burlington. Was that a chance meeting? No, it was by arrangement. Well, appointment, that is. Was the accused known to you prior to that day? No, the, the meeting had been arranged by Dr. Burlington. Oh, for what purpose? Well, I'm writing a series of feature articles for the Sunday Gazette. I wanted to do one on transvestite homosexuals, and Dr. Burlington set up an interview with Lola Martin. In Verities? Yes. This interview, a nightclub seems an unlikely place to conduct an interview. 
Yes, well, in my profession, my lord, one gets accustomed to conducting interviews in the unlikeliest places. In this particular instance, Lola Martin only agreed to be interviewed at the club. I see. Thank you, Mrs. Forrest. Thank you, my lad. Mr. Linger, apart from talking to yourself and Dr. Burlington, did the accused talk to anyone else? Oh, yes. He talked to virtually everyone in the club. He seemed to be very well known. Prior to his arrest, and apart from the conversation between yourself and Dr. Burlington, uh, did Martin make any particular reference to anyone in the club? Yes, there were, there were a couple of young guys there, and it was obvious that Lola Martin had taken a fancy to one of them. Do you see that young man in court today? Yes, that's him sitting over there. Detective Sergeant Lent. Yes, of course, we didn't know at the time that he was a police officer. <laughs> no, of course not. Why was it obvious that Martin had, well, to use your own words, taken a fancy to him? Well, the various remarks he made about him during the course of the evening. Well, as none of the jury, to my knowledge, were in the club on that particular night, do you think you could enlighten my lord and the jury as to exactly what the accused said about Detective Sergeant Lent? Yes. He said that Lent had a nice body. He also said, I fancy him. And later on he remarked, he wants to know, you know. Oh, and then just before he went out to the toilet, he said, I won't need my electric blanket tonight. I think I'm on a promise with that one in the leather jacket. You're quite sure he said all those things? Oh, yes, I'm quite sure. I wrote it all down at the time. You wrote down what you say? Oh, yes, my lord. I'm... I was interviewing him at the time, and they struck me as very good copy. Do you recall anything else in relation to the accused and Detective Sergeant Lent? What do you mean prior to his arrest? Yes, I do. Um, yes, at one point, Martin said hello to him and uh, gave him a big smile, and the copper said hello back to him. Oh, Martin was delighted. During the course of your interview with Martin, was the subject of male prostitution referred to? Yes, it was. Do you recall any of the remarks that the accused made? I recall all of them. I wrote down his comments. He said a great deal on the subject, but basically he said that he never sold his body, but that from time to time he did go out cruising. You mean sailing? Uh, no, my lord, it's a homosexual term meaning to go out and... Uh, seek another man either in clubs, bars, or on the streets. When Martin went to the toilets, can you recall where Sergeant Lent was? No, my lord, I cannot. The last I saw of the sergeant was when he came bursting out of the corridor that leads to the toilet. He was struggling with Lola Martin, who shouted out, Grab your handbags, girls. It's a raid. Lola Martin has been charged with persistently importuning and assaulting a police officer during the execution of his duty. At the close of yesterday's hearing, reporter Edward Linger gave evidence concerning the arrest of Martin. The case resumes, with Linger being examined by the prosecuting counsel. The jury in this trial has been selected from members of the public whose names appeared on the electoral register and who are eligible for jury service. Mr Linger, you were telling my lord and the jury at the moment when the accused appeared back in the main club area, struggling with Detective Sergeant Lent and shouting, Grab your handbags, girls. It's a raid. That's right. What happened next? Well, there was a certain amount of confusion at the club. <laughs> Some of the members laughed. Others screamed, ran for their coats and got out. Another man dressed in leather, who I learned later was also a detective, 
grabbed Lola Martin, and the two officers bundled him out of the club. Well, what did you do? Well, I accompanied Dr. Burlington to Fulchester Central Police Station, and a short while later, we both made statements. Mr. Linger, I'm much obliged. Mr. Linger, as I understand you, prior to that night, the night of Lola Martin's arrest, you'd not met my client. That's right, yeah. And your introduction was effected by Dr. Burlington. Yes, that's right. But this article you intended to write on transvestite homosexuals, what was your basic approach to the subject? Well, how do you mean? Well, was it sympathetic to the problems that confront homosexuals in our society? It's a factual piece. Yes, but what, to use your newspaper parlance, was your angle? There was no angle, just a factual piece of reporting. Were there to be any photographs of Mr. Martin contained in the article? Yes, there were. Photographs of him dressed as a woman? Yes, that's right. Is that why he was dressed as a woman on that particular evening? Yes. Huh. I'd arranged for a photographer to join us at the club later. Martin got arrested before we had a chance to take any photos. But you planned to take photos of Lola Martin in the club? That's right. He was quite agreeable. Now, you told my lord and the jury yesterday that this article was one of a series of feature articles that you were writing for the Sunday Gazette. Were the others merely factual ones, too? Yes, they were. They're about various aspects of our modern society. Would you describe them as sensationalistic? Certainly not. I'm not that kind of journalist. Oh, aren't you indeed? How much money were you being paid for these articles? Uh, Millard, is that question entirely relevant? My lord, I contend that it is highly relevant, and I assure you I will be able to demonstrate why. Very well, Mr. Lee. Mr. Lingo, would you answer the question? But what I earn has got nothing to do with this case. I direct you to answer the question. thousand pounds per article. I'm sorry, I beg your pardon? A thousand pounds per article. How many articles? Eight. Eight thousand pounds. How much had you agreed to pay Lola Martin for all the information he gave you to form the basis of one of these articles? I hadn't agreed to pay him anything. I don't work like that. No, indeed you don't. I put it to you that the only reason he agreed to help you was because you and Dr. Burlington advised him that the article would be sympathetic, reasonable and fair with regard to homosexuals in this country. I told him he got a fair crack of the whip. Under the circumstances, a bizarre phrase. You told him that you would report his views accurately, did you not? Yeah, something like that. And just now you said all of these articles were factual and certainly not sensationalistic. Yes, that's right. My Lord, I would like to introduce these articles as exhibits at this point. Uh, Millard, I object. Those articles have no bearing on this case. They were written prior to the night that these offences took place. My Lord, firstly, I wish the jury to be able to judge the calibre of this witness. Secondly, I contend that Linger's views, as expressed in these articles, had a direct bearing on the events that took place on the night of the alleged offences. Oh, well, Mr. Lee, might I see a copy of these articles? Certainly, my Lord. Oh, and Usher, if you could give a copy to the witness, please. These will become Exhibit 8. Now, Mr. Linger, if you could look at the first article in the Gazette, dated August the 8th, would you say that it was factual, unsensationalistic, unsens and without an angle? Certainly. Yeah. The article is headed, The Misalliance of Drugs, Sex, and Pop Music. It contains intimate details of the private life of a leading pop singer. That's right. Details that he gave me himself. It also contains a damning criticism of that singer. Did he criticise himself as well? Are those comments also his? Well, I had to knit the whole thing together. Yes. August the 15th, your article is headed The Casting Couch Syndrome. This one deals with a rising young actress who's the mother of an illegitimate son. A fact that you had unearthed and confronted her with. Millard, must we endure more of this? My Lord, I'm gratified to see that my learned friend shares my disgust. I would now like the witness to turn to the last item in this little bundle, the article written by this witness about Lola Martin. How did you get hold of this? It hasn't been published yet. The paper's waiting for this trial to finish. Where did you get these copies? Is this the article you wrote as a result of interviewing the accused in that nightclub? Yes, my lord. This will become a separate exhibit. Exhibit 9. This was the article that was going to give Lola Martin a fair crack of the whip, that was going to report his views accurately with sympathy and fairness. It is entitled, 
the sad twilight world of Lola Martin. Look, don't you moralise to me, Mr Lee. I give the public what they want. Circulation has gone up by over 80,000 per week since these articles started coming out, and you stand there making snide remarks about how much I get paid to write them. What are you implying, that I've exploited your precious client? He's paying you to defend him, isn't he? I mean, if, I, if I'm exploiting him by writing this, what the hell do you think you're doing? Defending him, Linger. Defending him. I put it to you that you obtained this interview with him under false pretenses. And during the course of the evening, he was handed a copy of one of the previous articles by the owner of the club, and then when he realised just what you were up to, he became distraught, and then he said, Right, you bastard, if you want a screaming queen, you can have one. I don't remember that. But your short shorthand notebook, Linger, the one you so faithfully recorded all his remarks in, the one that was so invaluable to you when you were being questioned by my learned friend, isn't that remark in there? I wouldn't write something like that down. No, it wouldn't make good copy, I suppose. No further questions. But you do recall that he remarked that Detective Sergeant Lent had a nice body. Yes. That the accused, talking of the officer, said, he wants to know, you know, and... I won't need my electric blanket tonight. I think I'm on a promise with that one in the leather jacket. Yes, he said all that. And he also said, did he not, that from time to time he went cruising, seeking out other men in clubs and bars and in the streets to have sex with? Yes, that is what he said. Thank you very much, Mr. Linger. Millard? I have no question. I call Dr. Burlington. Would you tell the court your qualifications? I'm a doctor of medicine, a bachelor of science, a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians with a diploma in psychiatry. Is the accused Lola Martin known to you? Yes, I first met him some seven years ago. Now, what were the circumstances of that meeting? He was sent to me by his local GP for treatment. Now, what condition were you treating him for? Why, his homosexual condition. He was disturbed and distressed because of his perversion and required help. How long was he a patient of yours? Sixteen months. He declined to come after that. Evidence has been given that you arranged for him to be interviewed by a reporter, Edward Linger. Is that correct? Yes. I thought he would make an excellent subject for an article on the problems of homosexuality. And the plan was that I should write a piece to accompany Mr Linger's article. Of course, that's had to be abandoned now because of this trial. I see. Just a moment, uh, Mrs Forrest. Dr Burlington, you've been advised that the paper will not now be carrying an article on the accused? That's what Mr Linger told me, my lord. Did he indeed? Let's carry on. Right. Thank you, Miller. Dr. Burlington, I'd like to come to the night of September 14th. Did you meet the accused in a club known as Verities? Yes, I did. In the company of the reporter, Edward Linger? Yes, that's right. Would you tell my lord and the jury your impressions and opinions of the accused during the earlier part of that interview in the club? I was struck by the change in Lola Martin. I had seen him from time to time in Fulchester since he stopped coming to me for treatment, but only to exchange the odd greeting. This was the first time I'd had real conversation with him since then. Well, in what way had he changed? He'd become very exhibitionist. The guilt that he had been suffering from during the treatment had become masked by aggression. Well, that's a classic manifestation. He had also become a very militant homosexual. He displayed in his manner and his speech a promiscuous attitude that had hitherto not been there. During the course of the evening, he became very attracted to a young man who was sitting at the bar with a friend. Oh, just one moment, Doctor. Do you see that young man anywhere in court? Yes, I noticed him when I came in. He's sitting next to Edward Linger. Detective Sergeant Lent. Is that his name? I gathered later that he was a policeman, but I didn't know his name. Are you were telling my lord and the jury that during the course of the evening, the accused became very attracted to the officer. Do you mean sexually? Yes, I do. Lola made various remarks indicating that he would like to take the young man to bed. Oh, do you recall any of them? The remarks the accused made? Oh, there were so many of them. Uh, one of them was, what a lovely piece of rough trade I must have him. Oh, rough trade is a homosexual term, my lord. It, uh, it's used to define men of a particular attitude and a particular dress. Can you be more specific? Well, uh, someone dressed as that policeman was at that night in the club. Black leather, masculine appearance. Does that help? Yes, the jury have seen an example of that during this trial.
If I could now turn to this treatment you gave my client, Doctor, I believe that you told my learned friend that you first met Lola Martin some seven years ago. Yes, that's correct. And that you were treating him for his homosexual condition. Yes. Why? I beg your pardon? Why did he need treatment? He came to me for help. Do you consider all homosexuals should be treated? Homosexuality is a deviancy from the norm. And what is the norm, Dr. Burlington? Heterosexuality. Really? Yes, really. Who said so, Dr. Burlington? Look, I haven't come here to debate deviancy. I am accustomed to this technique of putting the expert on trial. Don't defend him by putting me on trial. Dr. Burlington, please accept the apologies of an amateur. I've not had the benefit of your medical education. I therefore feel unable to term homosexuality as a, how did you phrase it, a perversion? I equally feel ill-equipped to term it as deviant behavior. These are terms that you, the expert, used when being examined by my learned friend. I want to know your source of information, your right, your justification for using such terms to describe a fellow human being. Really, my lad, I must protest. And so must I, my lord, not merely at the chauvinism of this witness, but at the interruption of my learned friend. I allowed her to examine this witness without a single objection, despite the fact that I found her subjectivity nauseating. I refer, of course, to the witness, not my learned friend. My Lord, I ask for the basic right to question this witness on some of the assumptions that were drawn on during her examination by prosecution. Mr. Lee, I must ask you to refrain from personal comment of that nature. Continue. But, my lad. Yes, Mrs. Forrest. Is my learned friend to be allowed to ask such questions? Yes, he is. The doctor is clearly an expert witness, and we are here to ascertain certain facts and certain truths. I'm obliged, my lord. Doctor, the law, in its infinite wisdom, decided some years ago that homosexuality between consenting persons over the age of 21 was legal. You have termed it perversion and deviancy. I want to hear you justify that assertion. I have no need to justify that assertion, Mr. Lee. It is my professional belief, based on 15 years of medical experience, it is also the professional belief of a great many of my colleagues. It is also directly the opposite view to that held by a great many members of the by medical some, profession, not a great is it many. not? It is generally accepted, not only in the medical profession, that homosexuality is a perversion, a deviation from the normal sexual behaviour pattern. Therefore, uh, taking even the most conservative of estimates, there must be quite a number of perverts right here in this courtroom. Oh, I wouldn't know about that. No, of course not. You would accept that there are probably some seven million homosexuals in this country. Estimates vary wildly. Yes, well, would you accept that we are talking, as far as homosexuality in the British Isles is concerned, of a number that is in millions? Oh, yes. And these are all perverts, deviants? Yes, in my opinion. Now we begin to progress, Doctor, in your opinion. I would like you to tell my lord and the jury exactly what treatment you gave Lola Martin when he was sent to you by his local doctor. Initially, he attended psychoanalytic group therapy. Yes, I gather a similar form of treatment is often used to uh, treat people suffering from a neurotic illness. Yes, that's right. Now, in the group that you placed Lola, were all the others homosexuals? No, by no means. So, he might well have been subjected to the prejudices and ignorance of the heterosexual group members. Well, that was not the intention. Mm -hmm. In my view, at that time, Lola Martin was neurotic. It was logical, therefore, to incorporate him within a group of neurotics for therapy. Yes, but this would, of course, confirm in his mind that homosexuality was a neurosis. Well, I believe that in many homosexuals it is. You see, prior to his treatment, Martin had been isolated. He'd had very little opportunity to talk over his, his feelings or his fears. Yes, I'm sure that we would all approve of that, but equally there is a danger in group therapy that someone like Lola Martin would be confronted with views that would reinforce the belief that he held at that time that homosexuality was a deviancy. Well, I wouldn't call that a danger. I would call that a very real hopeful chance. When a patient comes to me in a mentally disturbed condition because he's not conforming to the norm of society, it's my job to help him to conform. Yes, but did it ever occur to you to help him adjust to his sexual inclinations, to accept them, to come to terms with them, to live happily with them? Well, I don't consider it my job to help deviants to become happy deviants. It's my function to help them towards normality and ensure they accept that happily. Well, with regard to the group therapy and taking your view of what your job is, were you successful? No, I wasn't. Uh, did you try any other forms of treatment? Yes, I used aversion therapy in Lola Martin. Will you explain to my lord and the jury exactly what aversion therapy is and exactly how you applied it to Lola Martin, please, doctor? Well, the basic aim is to build up 
within the patient an aversion to the particular deviation that's troubling him or her. It's been used on alcoholics, drug addicts, compulsive gamblers, a whole range of deviations in fact. But I must, I must stress that this treatment is never compulsory. It's only given to patients who have volunteered for it. Could you tell us exactly how it was applied to Lola Martin? Certainly. In addition to his homosexual desires and feelings, Lola Martin evinced a decided tendency towards transvestism, uh, cross-dressing, wearing women's clothes. I asked him to bring photographs of himself dressed as a woman to my clinic and photographs of men with whom he had had love affairs. He was given an injection of an emetic, in his case, at apomorphine. He was then shown the photographs. He then vomited violently. The process was repeated on a number of occasions. It was, of course, the drug that you injected into him that caused the vomiting and not the photographs he was shown. Well, yes, of course. <laughs> the basic idea is to build up in the patient's mind feelings of nausea rather than excitement at such images, ultimately to deflect them from their homosexual and transvestite tendencies. Was this form of treatment successful with Lola Martin? No, it wasn't. Did you try any other forms of aversion I subsequently therapy? used electric shocks instead of the injections. Was this successful? He discontinued treatment before it was completed. Dr. Burlington, would I be right in thinking that aversion therapy as a treatment for the homosexual condition has been largely discredited? Discredited? In what way? Well, it's proved unsuccessful. On the contrary, there have been some remarkable successes. But surely there have also been some remarkable failures, and many patients apparently cured have lapsed to a life of homosexuality. Yes, well, of course, there's conflicting evidence. But for my part, I feel the treatment is very well worth persevering with. Well, would you agree that to destroy a person's homosexual sexuality doesn't automatically mean that you replace it with a heterosexual substitute? You may end up with a human being impotent and frustrated. Yes. Yes, that is true. But one can't stand by and do nothing when a patient comes asking for help and is distressed because of the aberration they're suffering from. You firmly believe that for Lola Martin to dress in women's clothes is an aberration? Are you suggesting that it's normal behaviour? Well, if there's any logic to your point of view, surely you are suffering from the same aberration, the same deviancy. Oh, really, my lad? My lord, I'm merely pointing out to the witness and to the jury. W would you step out of the witness box, please, doctor? But the doctor is standing there dressed as a man. She's wearing a man's suit. Thank you, doctor. Oh, really, my lord, that's absolutely irrelevant. Millions of women dress as the doctor is dressed. They are not considered to be deviants or suffering from aberration. I believe that is precisely the point that Mr. Lee is making. As your lordship pleases. But may I ask that my learned friend wanders no further from the trap? We are here to try the accused on two specific charges, not to examine society's views on homosexuality. Well, it would seem to me that the majority of Mr. Lee's questions have specifically concerned his client, particularly the, the treatment that the witness gave to the accused. Highly relevant information, I would have thought, but I do agree we do not want to wander too far abroad. As your lordship pleases. Now, Mr. Linger's article about my client, when you contacted Lola Martin and asked him to let this reporter conduct an interview, what did you tell him about the piece that Linger would be writing? I told him it would be about the transvestite homosexual. Yes, but did you tell him that the article would be expressing his views? Yes, that was why he was being interviewed. <laughs> did you tell him that the article would be fair and balanced? Yes, I did. Now, earlier you advised my lord and the jury that because of this trial, the article had been abandoned. That's right. Could the witness be shown a copy of Exhibit 9, please? Okay. Have you ever seen that before? No, I haven't. Now, would you, as an expert, consider that article to be a fair and balanced view of Lola Martin and his transvestite homosexual tendencies? No, I certainly would not. Do you recall a particular moment during that evening in the club when Lola Martin was handed a newspaper article by the owner of the club? No, I'm afraid I don't. Oh. Well, when being questioned by my learned friend, you described Lola Martin, his manner that evening, as being promiscuous in his manner and his speech. You also said that he was aggressive. I put it to you that he only began to behave in that manner towards the end of the evening. 
Certainly his behaviour became more erratic towards the end of the evening. After he'd been shown a previous article written by the reporter and after he'd realised just what kind of an article was going to be written about him. Well, I know nothing about him having been shown any article, but certainly he became very belligerent towards Mr Lingo and myself. He accused us of exploiting him. Did he really? Yes. Paranoia is very common amongst homosexuals. Illusions of persecution, you mean? Yes, I do. Were you being paid by the Sunday Gazette for the contribution you were making towards that feature article? Yes. How much? Two hundred pounds. The homosexual industry appears to be booming. Doctor, have you recently returned from a lecture tour of the United States? Yes, I have. Lecturing, I believe, on homosexual and transvestite deviancy. That's right. I gave 15 lectures on that subject at various universities. Now, one newspaper report I have here, the San Francisco Post, states that you were paid one thousand dollars per lecture. Is that accurate? Yes, it is. And I was also paid expenses if we're going to have an examination of my earnings. Presumably the views you expounded on that lecture were similar to the views that you have aired here today? Yes. Of course, the questions the students asked me were considerably more intelligent than the questions I've been asked here today. In that case, Doctor, I will refrain from asking any further questions. Millard? Not wishing to demonstrate my own stupidity, Mrs. Forrest, I will decline the opportunity of questioning this witness. Now that is my case, Millard. I call Lola Martin. Mr. Lee, I assume that your examination in chief will be a lengthy one. Yes, my lord. In that case, I will adjourn until tomorrow. Lola Martin has been charged with persistently importuning and assaulting a police officer during the execution of his duty. He's about to be called to give evidence on his own behalf. The jury in this trial has been selected from members of the public whose names appeared on the electoral register and who are eligible for jury service. I call Lola Martin. Who are you? Lola Martin, my lord. Mr. Lee, is this your client? Yes, my lord, it is. He desired that the jury should see him dressed exactly as he was on the night of his arrest. Seems to me extremely irregular. Mrs. Forrest, do you have any objection? Uh, I I'm sorry, my lord. Yeah, I said, do you have any objections to the defendant being dressed in those clothes? With the greatest respect, my lord, I feel that whether my learned friend has or has not any objections is beside the point. With respect, prosecution counsel cannot decree what a defendant should or should not wear in court. That is a matter for you. Millard, I'm inclined to agree with my learned friend. Of course, he may be guilty of contempt. Really, my lord, if one takes that view, then Dr. Burlington, who I noticed today is wearing a dress, was guilty of contempt yesterday. Let us proceed, Mr. Lee. With the greatest respect, my lord, my client has not yet been sworn in. Come along. What are we waiting for? Um, what is your religion? See thee. Is your full name Lola Martin? Yes, it is. Is Lola your official name? I see that you were charged under that name. Yes, it is, my lord. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Thank you, my lord. You've heard yourself described in court as a transvestite and a homosexual. Do you accept those descriptions as being accurate? Yes, I do. I have also heard yourself described as a deviant suffering from a sexual aberration. Do you accept those descriptions as being accurate of you? Certainly not. Any more than I accept most of the definitions from other experts when they attempt to explain away people like me. To what experts and definitions are you referring? 
There have been so many. According to Jung, I'm basically a heterosexual who doesn't know how to do it. According to Freud, I have an Oedipus complex and I want to take my mother to bed. Uh, Freud also feels that I'm terribly immature. According to the late Archbishop of Canterbury, Dr. Fisher, I'm indulging in a shameful vice, which is a grievous sin, and from which deliverance should be sought by any means. I have no wish to single out that dear Christian. His views are shared by the Catholic Church and most of Western Christianity. According to Dr. David Rubin, whose views were expressed in a book that has sold over half a million copies, I haunt bus stations, cinemas, car parks, public washrooms, and walk up to total strangers and without a word, take off their trousers and make love to them. According to Kraft Ebbing, I masturbated too much when I was a child. Havelock Ellis thinks that my dressing up in women's clothes is an aberration, but then he also thinks that urinating and defecating over other people is great fun. You see, there are so many experts, Mr. Lee. Yes, I do see, Lola. How do you feel about the treatment Dr. Burlington gave you? Disgust. The worst thing I've ever done in my life was to agree to let that person give me so-called medical treatment. She exposed me to a group of neurotics, and when that didn't work, made me vomit again and again. Why did you agree to that treatment? Well, because I was full of guilt and fear about being a homosexual. It took me a long time to realize it was the guilt and fear that were unnatural, not my homosexuality. Do you still feel any guilt or fear? Certainly not. I'm proud I'm gay. I have a basic human right to be gay. I have choice. Real choice. I don't know about the psychological reasons or the, the physiological reasons. I don't know about the chromosome reasons, but I do know what I am. I am a homosexual. Now, feeling the way you do about Dr. Burlington, why did you cooperate and agree to be interviewed at the club? Because no matter what my personal feelings about Dr. Burlington and the kind of medical view that she represents were, I had a duty to speak up for the oppressed minority of which I'm a member. You mean the homosexuals in this country? Yes, I do. Although, when you remember that it has been publicly stated that this so-called minority of which I'm a member is greater in this country than the number of Jews or Roman Catholics, one begins to wonder whether that minority might not well be a majority. Certainly, if every gay person in this country was to have the courage to stand up and be counted, I think those who govern us and who make the laws by which we are forced to live might have a few shocks. But if every gay politician, every gay lawyer, every gay probation officer, train driver, surgeon, priest, miner, footballer, teacher, and all the rest of them would only stand up Oh, who knows? It might be the turn of the straights to be threatened. Now, this interview that you gave to the reporter at Verity's Club, what did you talk to him about? I talked about um, the way the medical profession in this country regards homosexuality as a sickness. I talked about the politicians of this country, who have one set of laws for the so-called normals, and another set for people like me. What do you mean, another set for people like you? The same laws govern all our people. Well, I'm afraid they don't. If you're normal, and by normal, I mean that you go to bed with people of the opposite sex, then, provided the person you're going to bed with consents, you can do it if you're 16 years of age or over. You can do it in Scotland and Northern Ireland. You can do it in the Merchant Navy. You can do it in any of the armed forces. You can advertise that you want to do it. If, like me, you are a homosexual, you are not allowed to do it in any of these instances. Although the age of consent for females is 16. The age of full legal adulthood is 18. The only item of legislation on the statute book where the age of 21 is retained as dividing line is for consenting male homosexuals. And that's what you were talked about when you were interviewed at Verity's Club? That, and a lot more besides. I talked about the oppression facing a gay person attempting to get custody of their children. Hmm. About the way we are persecuted by the police. And did the reporter write all of this down? He certainly did. Kept saying it would make great copy. Yes. You've heard evidence given that during the course of the interview in the club, towards the end of the evening, your attitude became belligerent. Is that so? Yes, that is correct. Why was that? Why? Because I realized that I'd been conned. Ripped off. I beg your pardon? Oh, ripped off, exploited, my lord. And in a way, that's just what that pair had done to me. 
Certainly the report I had. How did you discover this? Well, the owner of the club, Oscar, he asked me who the guy was, Linger, the reporter. I told him. He freaked. And he showed me a newspaper with one of Linger's articles in it, and I freaked. What do you mean? Well, I realized that I'd been conned. That all Linger wanted to do was to exploit the fact that I'm gay. You know, that sort of thing. Titillate while they pontificate. Moralize while they sensationalize. So, what did you do? I went back and gave him a mouthful. I told him just what I thought of him. I said, right, you bastard. If you want a screaming queen, you can have one. Now, why did you say that? Because I felt bitter. I felt cheated. The only way I could think to hit back was the way I actually did. What did you actually do? I became what he'd come looking for. A raving, screaming queen. Hmm. You know, the sort of thing. I went rushing up to people, kissing them and shouting all those quaint words we homosexuals are supposed to be obsessed with. I thought, if you wanted a cliché, you may as well get a good one. Now, you've heard evidence given that you commented on Detective Sergeant Lent. Do you accept that evidence as being true? Oh, yes. That's true. And this was part of the act you were putting on for the reporter, was it? Oh, no, that was no act. I fancied him. Did you? Oh, yes. He'd been looking at me all night. As far as I was concerned, he wanted to know. Now, you've heard that police officer's evidence. What do you have to say about his version of the events? Well, they are accurate. Except for the fact that he certainly did kiss me back. And he never showed me any police identification. Now, did you ask him to go back to your home? Of course I did. I thought he was gay. Did you hit him? Yes, I did. Right on the jaw, as hard as I could. Why did you do that? Because he grabbed me and hurt me and said something about I was going to go where he wanted me to go. Now, did you think at that moment that he was a policeman? I certainly did not. I thought he was rough trade. When he grabbed me, I thought the trade was a, a bit too rough, so I, uh, I whacked him. You're quite certain in your own mind that when you spoke to him and you subsequently hit him, you thought he was a fellow homosexual. Of course I did. But I don't want to hide behind that by asking for compassion or kindness. I've come here to ask for the same justice that will be given to the straight, to the hetero. I thought he was gay. That's why I chatted him up. That's why I kissed him. Why he kissed me back is his problem. Well, maybe he did make a genuine mistake. Maybe he thought I really was a woman. Or maybe she's a closet queen. What is a, a closet queen? Well, it's the vast number of homosexuals in this country. People who are afraid to stand up and say that they are homosexuals. I see. It's to leave. All right. I have no further questions, my lord. I have no questions to ask the defendant, Milan. Really, Mrs. Forrest? <laughs> no, Milan. In my view, he has admitted his guilt to the charges he faces while answering his own counsel's questions. Anything I would ask him would be superfluous. Your full name is Oscar Douglas? Sure is. Are you the owner of a club situated in Earlham Street, Forchester, a club named Verities? That's right. It's my club. Uh, what would you say if I told you that the night Martin was arrested, the police were in your club looking for drug traffickers? I'd say some bum and handed you a lot of bullshit. Mr. Douglas, you appear to have some posterior obsession. Would you moderate your language? Do you recall that particular night, please, Mr. Douglas? You bet I do. Never had trouble like that before. Now, do you recall any conversation that you had with Lola Martin before he was arrested? Sure, I recall warning him about that reporter he was talking to. Why did you warn him? Well, I knew the guy was two-faced. I'd read some of the stuff he'd written earlier for the Gazette. Did you tell Lola about any of that stuff? Right. Showed her one of the articles, too. A bunch of crap about some poor girl with an illegitimate kid. What was Lola Martin's reaction? <laughs> he freaked. I heard him go back to the table and really get into that reporter. Did you see, and do you see now, anyone else in the court who was in the club that evening? Yeah, that dame over there and the guy sitting in front of her turned out to be a cop. Turned out to be a cop. You didn't know prior to that evening that he was a policeman. No, I didn't. Didn't know about his boyfriend being police either. But aren't both the policemen members of the club? Of course they are, but they joined under assumed names. I didn't know they were police. Would you have still let them join if you hadn't known that they were policemen? Sir, I'm a realist. 
Of course I'd have let them join. You don't run a club here unless the police are happy with it. But if I'd known they were police and that they were looking for drugs, I would have told them that they're wasting their time. Like I said, my, I run a clean joint. Now, if you were not aware that they were police officers, did you form any conclusions as to who or what they might be? I thought they were either gays or charabang trade. I beg your pardon? A charabang trade, Your Honor. Uh, people who like to mix with gays, but uh, who aren't gay themselves. Ah, rather like supporters of a football team. They don't actually play themselves, but they like to watch others who do. <laughs> yeah, never thought of it like that. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Thank you, my lord. Now, we've heard evidence that Lola Martin used the ladies' toilet that night. You are aware, are you not, that Lola Martin is a man? Of course I am. You mean it's permissible for men to use the ladies' toilets in your club? If they're in drag, they use the ladies. If they're dressed as men, they use the gents. It's rather an unusual arrangement, surely. I've never had any complaints. I see. Now, were you present when Lola Martin was arrested and brought back into the main area of the club? Yes, I was. One of the leather guys, who later turned out to be a cop, had a hold of Lola, who was struggling. Lola let out a shout about the joint being raided. Most of the customers just started laughing. Couldn't believe it, I guess. Mm. Then this other guy in leather leaps up, grabs hold of Lola, and they hustle him outside. And that was the first indication you had that these two men were police officers? Certainly was. Mr. Douglas, thank you very much. This club you run... What about it? You referred to it just now as a clean joint, is that right? That's right. Well, I put it to you that it's hardly clean. A meeting place for transvestites, for homosexuals. What's the matter with gays having a drinking club? You are here to answer my questions. I'm not here to answer yours. <laughs> well, ask me a question that requires an answer, not crap like that. Mr. Douglas, I've warned you once before, please moderate your language. You accept that your club is a notorious meeting place for homosexuals, do you? Not notorious, lady. Famous. You make your money out of providing a drinking club for homosexuals and other deviants. Is that right? That's right, lady. Presumably any riffraff can join this place. Oh, no, ma'am. For example, I wouldn't let you join. Could the witness be asked to refrain from making insulting remarks? Mr. Douglas, Mrs. Forrest is not applying for membership. I must warn you that you are very close to committing contempt of court. Now, would you just answer the question, please? Thank you, Milan. Mr. Douglas, this club of yours... It was considered by the police to be a scene for drug trafficking, to such an extent that they've been keeping observation on it for a number of months. Now, would that not suggest to you that there is no smoke without fire? What it suggests to me is that, for reasons of their own, I don't know them, they figured somebody might be pushing in my place. What it also suggests to me is that they should go on an efficiency course. I've never even been busted for being open a minute after time, let alone for running a joint where drugs get pushed. No? Well, perhaps you content yourself with running a joint for mentally sick people and exploiting them by taking their money and profiting from their deviancy. Who are these mentally sick people, lady? The homosexuals that frequent your club. In that case, include me in. I'm gay too, you know. I have no further questions. When I talk of the evidence, I do not mean what Kraft Ebbing wrote about homosexuals or what the late Archbishop of Canterbury said of them. I refer to the evidence relating to the two offences with which the defendant is charged, namely, persistently importuning for an immoral purpose and assaulting a police officer in the execution of his duty. You have heard the evidence of Detective Sergeant Lent, of how the accused said to him, why don't you come back to my place? We could have a lot of fun. You have heard that officer testify how when he attempted to arrest the accused, he was hit, and hit hard, of the struggle that ensued. So violent as a struggle that a fellow officer was obliged to go to Sergeant Lent's aid. Astonishingly, you have heard the defendant confirm that evidence. He agrees. He tried to pick up the officer with a view to having sexual intercourse with him. He agrees that he hit him. You will remember that I did not cross-examine the accused. Well, what was the point? He had freely admitted his guilt while being questioned by his own counsel. What is his defense? <laughs> it is. I thought Sergeant Lent was a homosexual. I did not know he was a police officer. Well, the fact that Lent was indeed a police officer is absolutely irrelevant in this case. 
Martin is not the first person to appear in the courts of this country because he did not realize that a plain clothes police officer was in fact a policeman. My learned friend may well talk to you of agents provocateurs police or their agents who encourage people to commit crimes they would not have otherwise committed. Well, in this case, as in all cases, you will take the law from my lord. But my view of it, based on a judgment from the Court of Appeal, is that agents provocateurs are necessary within our society, and that although their role in any particular case might affect sentence, it does not affect the question of guilty or not guilty. I believe that having considered all of the evidence in this case, you will be left with only one conclusion. But the defendant is guilty on both counts. As for homosexuals being mentally sick, now that seems to me to be an echo of the view expressed by Dr. Burlington in the witness box when she extolled the disgusting practices of aversion therapy. I find it ironic that the doctor has just returned from a highly paid tour of the United States where she expounded her punitive views in some 15 colleges and universities. Ironic, because in 1974, the American Psychiatric Association removed homosexuality from its list of psychiatric diseases. They at least no longer consider it an illness. Now, my learned friend remarked that you may find Lola Martin's attire offensive. You may. But do you consider it offensive when Danny LaRue entertains us? Do you consider it offensive when Dick Emery or Benny Hill dress in women's clothes? Was society outraged when the National Theatre in 1967 produced Shakespeare's As You Like It with an all-male cast, many of them, of course, dressed as women. When men of the talent and reputation of Lord Olivier and Sir Alec Guinness performed as women, were you scandalized? Did you walk out of the theatres and the cinemas when Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon cavorted in the movie Some Like It Hot, dressed as women? Do you ban your children from listening to The Who when they sing songs like I'm a Boy, or stop them watching singers like Mick Jagger or David Bowie when they appear in women's clothes? Do you pick at the theatres during the pantomime season because of the panto dames? Men dressed as women? Verities is a club for homosexuals. My client is a homosexual. He saw that policeman dressed in a classical homosexual outfit. He smiled at the man who smiled back. He kissed the man and has sworn on oath that the police officer returned that kiss. Now, you will have formed your own opinion of Lola Martin, but I venture to submit that whatever that opinion, you will agree with me that he's an honest man. I contend that Lola Martin was incited to break the law by that officer. Now, with regard to the Court of Appeal ruling, that the use of agents provocateurs is acceptable, I would remind you that that court ruling was made in 1974. It has been considerably modified since that date. I would refer you to two cases this year. In July 1976, at the Old Bailey, two men were charged with dealing in cannabis worth 14,000 pounds. They were acquitted after direction from the judge. He didn't even bother to send the jury out. They were acquitted by Judge Gillis after it became clear, during the course of the trial, that the two defendants had been tricked by an agent provocateur in September of this year, a jury returned a verdict of not guilty in a case involving alleged importuning in a men's lavatory. They returned that verdict after the defense counsel's insistence that the police officer in this case had acted as an agent provocateur. Now you may agree that Detective Sergeant Lent played the same role in this case. If you do, you must acquit my client on both charges. If you believe that Detective Sergeant Lent enticed the accused, if you believe that the police officer encouraged him, then it is your duty to acquit the defendant. Both counsel have expressed their views concerning the role of agent provocateur. Clearly there is a divergence of opinion, not only between counsel but also between the various law opinions that they cite. I direct you that each case must be taken on its own particular merits. There are guidelines laid down for police officers in this area. 
That line clearly distinguishes between acceptable cooperation with suspects and unacceptable provocation to commit offences. I leave it to you to determine whether the police stayed on the right side of that line or whether they ventured over it. I must ask you now to retire, elect a foreman, and consider your verdict. Will your foreman please stand? Just answer this question, yes or no. Have you reached a verdict upon which you are all agreed? Yes. On the first count of persistently importuning for an immoral purpose, do you find the defendant Lola Martin guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. On the second count of assaulting a police officer in the execution of his duty, do you find the defendant Lola Martin guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. Lola Martin, you have been acquitted on both counts. You are free to leave this court. <laughs>